Um, so uh, today we have a speaker, Lindart uh, Hayden. I hope I'm saying it properly. He's from uh, NC State. He's a young guy, obviously. He got his PhD in 2018 from KU Leuven. And then he went over to NC State, um, where he's now an assistant professor, research professor, I believe, right? <clears throat> And so he's a theorist who has his hand in a lot of really interesting projects. I know him from a couple now, uh, Wizard and Helium Cress, but you work with ultra cold neutrons and many other things. So he's going to tell us about some of the wonderful stuff he's done. I think in particular, NAB experiment and some, I forget it. Some I haven't read the abstract in a bit. Yeah. Fun. So anyways, take it away, Lane Dart. All right. Oh, and I forgot. Uh, I've given these away so many times that I've never gotten them myself. But we have a laser pointer. Oh, oh my God, it's even it's engraved. Even engraved with your name. So, but oh. it doesn't change the pages, so you might want to okay, use well, the it's, other it's, it's the <laughs> fanciest, uh, fanciest colloquium gift I've had so far. So, thank you. All right, let me try to put this on without breaking it. Okay, does that work? Good for everyone? Excellent. Okay, perfect. So thanks everyone for showing up, both obviously here in real life and virtual. Um, and uh, thanks to Dan for the invitation. It's very kind. It's nice to be in Texas. It's my first time. Uh, it is hot, um, but uh, at least here it's quite nice. So what I want to talk to you today is, uh, is actually maybe a bit of a weird kind of talk in the sense that there will be both a let's say more theory oriented parts and there will be more an experimentally oriented talk. Like Dan said, I'm involved in a couple of different things. And um, now actually sort of moving more towards the experimental side, but still have fingers in a couple of different theory pots. Okay, so let's get going. So first, hunting for new physics with neutron decay, right? So what I want to talk to you about, or just to get everyone on the same page, is just to provide some context, right? And the context is the standard model. Let's see, can I get the zoom bar to not obstruct the screen? Yep. Wide video panel, is that it? Floating. Perfect. Okay, so just to, to know what I'm talking about, right? So I'm talking about the standard model. And so the standard model is a mathematical construction, right? It's a quantum field theory. It's described by these so-called reasonably simple gauge groups, right? Like out of all of the symmetry groups that you could write down, we sure as hell are lucky that it's just these ones, right? Now it gives us a number of particles, right? Where we have our quarks on top, we have our leptons on the bottom, and then we have these, uh, these bosons in the middle. And so basically with this particle content, we can describe pretty much everything that we can see aside from obviously a couple different things, right? Does that work? If I stand closer maybe? I think it died on me. And we'll just do it manually. Okay, so in the standard model, we have about 18 free parameters, right? Things like masses, couplings, and so on. And from someone like my point of view, this works great, but also in an uh, almost in an annoying kind of way, right? Because it seems to just keep on providing results which are consistent with experiment, even though I've been trying for the past, let's say 50 years now, right? And this is, let's say so good or so bad that this works up to essentially scales of tens to hundreds of TeV, depending on which observables we're looking at. Now, as most of you in the room know, right? There's still some open questions. Right, the open questions are fairly trivial or fairly trivial to ask. As in like, what's dark matter? How do we get gravity in the picture? What about neutrino masses, right? Because you could say that sort of canonically the fact that neutrinos have mass is already a beyond standard model kind of physics effect. But clearly there's some things that we need to sort out. And so just um, to showcase the point, Right, if people haven't seen this before, does the sound play? Maybe with some delay. All right, so there's this, um, there's this people, maybe for the older people in the audience, there's this movie called Powers of Ten, right? Where essentially to get a sense of scale in the universe, um, you're zooming out every couple seconds and one meter becomes 10 meters, 100 meters and so on. And the Simpsons are kind of a spoof on this, just to show you that the universe goes through the sort of cyclic motion 
of, let's say, complexity. And then again, back to, to very simple kind of structures. Um, and it seems to keep on going through the length scales, even as we uh, go in the opposite direction as well. All right, so we can go down to effectively subatomic uh, structures, and we keep seeing this sort of cycle or cycle of, uh, of of complexity versus simplicity. And somehow, over all of these orders of magnitude, and now Homer says, "Whoa, okay." So over all of these orders of magnitude, somehow the standard model, it's almost a miracle that this works in a way, right? With just 18 different parameters. Now we're obviously not satisfied, right? And so there's reasons to be curious even more because there's these so-called anomalies. Right? The zoom bar showed up again, right? So we have these several standard model or we have these several experiments where we have three to four sigma or three to four standard deviations away from the standard model prediction, which seem enticing, right? This is, for instance, in the flavor sector at LHCb, but similarly, there's the muon g minus two result, for instance, um, which is let's say four sigma away from the standard model. There's this Atomki beryllium eight anomaly where people seem to see a bump. Is it a weird kind of particle? There's the reactor antineutrino anomaly. If there's some people in the audience who are familiar with it, and so you can ask yourself the question: Are we in this era of anomalies where these anomalies are actually real, right? Or is this so-called Littlewood's law of miracles? And so what that means is um, assume that. A miracle is something you define as something which happens once in a million. Now, let's say that you have an experience happening to you every second, then you would get a miracle every month, right? So clearly, does that still constitute a miracle, right? Are we actually seeing real things or are these just statistical fluctuations and we end up just looking for something which isn't there? Well, so then the question is, what do we do? Right, and so from my point of view, I think a great thing to do is to test the standard model, but now at low energy, right? We're used to thinking about this in terms of collider experiments, right? Where we go to high energy and see if we produce new particles. What we can do instead is we can try to do precision measurements and in that way be sensitive to exotic particles, but in so-called an off-shell way, right? So essentially where we don't directly produce these particles, but new particles might influence the results through some virtual exchange. Right, so you could think about this as looking for footprints rather than trying to actually conjure up the entire beast in an accelerator. And so the weak interaction, right, one of the three that's described by the standard model, is I think very nice. The reason why it's very nice is because it breaks symmetries, right? Like it breaks charge conjugation, it breaks parity. We know this since the 50s. There's parameters we can test with far-reaching consequences, CKM unitarity and also just see what the Lorentz structure actually is, right? Like, you know, the QED is just a pure vector transition. What does the weak interaction look like? And so the nice thing is that all of these can be probed in some form or other by beta decay, be that nuclear or neutron or anything else, right? And so today we'll talk about two of those. So for people not familiar, let me introduce these concepts. And, um, the reason why we're using beta decay. So beta decay, as I'm sure you've seen at some point, right? The simplest example of a beta decay is the decay of a neutron going into a proton, emits a W boson, and out comes an electron and an antineutrino. Right? Simple enough. What happens here is a down quark turns into an up quark. Now, what's nice about beta decay is that the energy scale here, right? The, the energies of the electrons that come out are on the MeV scale, right? Which is way, way less than the mass of a W boson, which is at around 80 GeV. What that means is that basically this collapses onto a point and we don't really care about what happens, let's say underneath here to first order, which makes life a lot easier, right? Another thing which I often say is that as nuclear physicists, we have a great, great advantage because we have this entire nuclear chart to choose from, right? In theory, you could pick the isotope that best suits the thing that you want to do, and it helps if you have a lot of choices, right? And so as nuclear physicists, we have this entire nuclear chart to choose from. Clearly, there's also some challenges, right? So if we're looking at nuclear physics, 
um, one of the things that probably pop into your head are, well, that's complicated, right? Because this is strongly interacting stuff. And we know that things which are strongly interacting, you can't really do perturbation theory on, are very difficult to calculate, right? Obviously people have found ways to go around this, but you're still stuck with an inherently complicated system. Another thing is that if you want to do this to high precision, that means that you also have to cross this vast scale gap, right? Because what happens in beta decay is I effectively have a quark level process, right? Down quark turns into an up quark or something. However, my beta decay happens not just single quark, right? It's actually, it's a nucleon inside of a nucleus, inside of an atom, and maybe inside of a molecule as well. And so if you want to do this to the precision level, that means that you have to now take care of all of this kind of stuff. And so that clearly makes it more difficult. Now, getting to the first part is the so-called CKM unitary, right? So that's one of the interesting observables that we can look at. And so it's named after Kabibo Kobayashi Yamaskawa, right? Italian and two Japanese physicists. And it's essentially a very simple concept, at least mathematically, right? It's just a three by three unitary matrix, right? It's like a complex rotation matrix between mass eigenstates, right? The states which actually propagate versus the weak eigenstates, the, uh, the states that actually undergo the interaction. And so what you know from, let's say, I don't know, introductory physics or, or mathematics is that, you know, for a unitary matrix, if I add the sum of the squares of all of my elements in a row or in a column, they have to add up to one, right? Because it's a unitary matrix. So if I take the first row here, for example, all right, then I have VUD squared, right? Up, down, up, and strange, and up and bottom. And so if I take these matrix elements, square them and sum them, they should add up to one. Now, for the experimental situation, right, where do we get these numbers from? Right, so neutron decay or beta decay, I already told you, right, is up, down, right? Something changed like a bottom, sorry, a down changes into an up or vice versa. And so VUD we typically get from beta decay. VUS we get from mesons. And this VUB matrix element, we know with sufficient precision that this square of this matrix element is 10 to the minus five or so. And experimentally, we're not there yet with the other ones. So we don't care about it, right? So effectively we're looking whether these two numbers lie on the circle, right? X squared plus Y squared equals one. Now, why is that interesting? It's because if we can measure these numbers very well and we measure a deviation from unity, that could mean that there's a whole bunch of exotic physics coming in. And if we measure this precisely enough, we are now sensitive to TeV scale new physics, right? Which is the same scale as where colliders operate, for instance, right? Except that we don't have to build a 26 kilometer diameter machine to probe it with. So where are we right now, right? So I told you about how this works. What's the current status? And the short answer is, is that, well, we're in another one of these anomalies. And so now they got another name, so-called Kabibo angle anomaly. And just looking at this plot, we don't really have to take a very long look at it, right? But so what I want you to see is that my unit circle is this black line over here, right? That says unitarity. And so then we have a number of different experimental ways of getting VUD and VUS. And the thing that you should see is that none of these overlap or converge nicely onto a point, right? And so clearly we have conflicting measurements or let's say conflicting extractions from measurements. And at this point, it's really not clear what's going on, right? Is this early signs of new physics? Are there lattice QCD artifacts in there because we need some numbers to actually get to VUD or VUS, and we don't really know. However, the situation got more interesting. And the situation got more interesting less than a year ago. Right? This is all fairly recent development. Um, but so it turned out that we have now another way of trying to get at this VUS number. And so again, we're not gonna go into great detail here. The point is that on the y-axis over here are different channels for you to get the same number, right? And something that you should see immediately is that none of these line up and give you a nice consistent answer, right? So you can make a world average, but it has like a scale factor of 2.2. So clearly there's something wrong. And so you could try and interpret this as some scale or some new physics coming in at some scale. But what we can for sure say is that if we take all of this at face value, then it seems that the most precise VUD and VOS determinations are not consistent with unitary, whatever that may mean, right? There's significant internal inconsistencies 
to getting this matrix element. And if we were to take this at face value, right? So we take all of these numbers and try to fit it with some potential new physics, then we can get a nice agreement at the three sigma level, right? So we're again sort of in this twilight zone where it's not quite five sigma, but it's also not quite one sigma or something. So we're not really sure what to do with. It. Okay. So then you can ask yourself the question, well, we have this situation now. If we were to take it at face value, what would beyond the standard model physics look like in this particular sector? And so I won't flash too many formulas, but this will be one of them. And so what you've probably seen in some introductory nuclear or, or introductory particle physics is that the standard model weak interaction has this so-called vector minus axial vector structure, right? It's, it couples only to left-handed particles, right? That's what the minus here means for the axial. However, we can write something which is more generally true. Right, so I can write a so-called Lagrangian where I have a bunch of coupling parameters up front and I've highlighted everything which is not standard model here in red, right? So all of these small epsilons are not present in the standard model, okay? Now, if I were to somehow measure these and let's say, or measure these or let's say put an upper bound on them because these happen, let's say, at the weak scale, right? We're talking about weak interaction physics. That means that if I put a bound on these different epsilons at the 10 to the minus four range, then we're again probing physics at the 15, 10 to 15 TeV scale, right? So the two numbers that you should sort of remember is we need to get to relative precision of 0.1%, which is a great challenge in and of itself. But if we get there, we essentially exceed direct accelerator potential with sort of a clearer path to go forwards rather than having to build a new collider, right? which I also think is a good idea if there's people in the audience, which would otherwise write me down. Okay, so then the number that we cared about was VUD, right? And so then you ask yourself the question, how do I actually get that number? Well, if I have some semi-leptonic, right? So in my final state, I have some leptons, which is precipitated by some up-down uh, up down weak interaction process, then my decay rate will always look according to the fall, right? So I have decay rate big gamma, which goes according to a coupling constant, the matrix element we care about, there's phase space, right? Just kinematics. And then there is a hadronic matrix element, right? Just overlap of initial and final states. So the things that you need to know experimentally are G Fermi, Right, and the G Fermi, we can get very precisely because we can measure the muon lifetime really precisely. And so we know that to much better than 10 to the minus four. All right, so then we need to know these additional theoretical radiative corrections. And we'll talk about what that means in just a sec. We can talk, or we need to know the hadronic theory. And for each beta transition, we need to know experimental quantities, right? What's its half-life? What's the Q value? What's the branching ratio of each transition that we're interested in for pulling this number out? Right? Not only that, you need to know all of this to the 10 to the minus four level. And what's interesting there is that there, over the past three to four years or so, there have been significant changes in the field. And so the field has undergone quite a bit of, um, of shakeup, but I think for the better. So first, before we get into the real details, right? Obviously the hardest part of the previous one was this hadronic theory, right? I just talked to you about how nuclear physics is hard, how strongly bound systems are hard. So we're going to try and make this hadronic theory part as easy as possible. And what that means is we have four different possibilities effectively. And so the simplest beta decay is just the pion, right? It's a meson, there's not even any nuclear structure or whatever going on. It also undergoes beta decay, so that's great, right? Second up is the neutron. Well, again, no nuclear structure, it's just a single nucleon also great contender. And then there's two slightly more complicated ones. One is the super loud zero plus to zero plus decays. And the only thing that you need to understand from this is the zero plus to zero plus, right? So that's initial and final spin parity. And what you know from quantum mechanics from let's say wigner eckert theorem or something, it means that there's only very few operators which can actually come in to the decay rate, right? Because you need to couple a spin zero to a spin zero. So that makes a the theory part easy. Finally, there's these so-called mirror decays, which I won't really have time to talk about, but due to, an under, due to another sort of underlying symmetry, you get, uh, or you simplify a lot of the nuclear structure as well. Again, looking at the experimental situation, this is a, a graph by, by John Hardy, which was slightly modified, where we have these four different candidates 
lined up for how well these do for extracting BUD. Right, and so let's start with the pion maybe, right? Because we said that one was the easiest. And so there's three different contributions. One is experiments, then there's these radiative corrections, and then there's nuclear. Obviously the pion doesn't have any nuclear corrections. However, measuring pion beta decay is extremely hard because in the standard model, the decay rate for the pi on beta decay, the branching ratio is like 10 to the minus eight, right? So pretty much everything which comes from pions, right? So if you have like decay at rest pions, pretty much everything that comes out is not pi on beta decay, right? It's pi to mu minus mu plus or u plus e minus, which vastly outnumbers anything that you want. Then looking at the neutron, for instance, again, no nuclear corrections and experimentally we're quite a lot closer, but the reigning sort of candidate for the past, let's say 50 years has been the super loud, zero plus to zero plus decays. Now I just told you that there has been some shakeup in the field recently because these nuclear corrections initially were actually estimated to be quite small. However, with some new developments, new nuclear apanizo theory, et cetera, coming in, it turned out that we had to inflate this uncertainty quite a bit and we're not quite sure what value to put there or how to sort of quickly move forward for all of the cases that we extract data from, right? Because we're essentially going from mass 10 to let's say mass 74, which makes this from a nuclear point of view a very hard problem to solve. So then what ends up is the neutron looking pretty good, right? There's no nuclear corrections. Experimentally, we can beat down on it and we can see where we get. Right? And so if we look at the neutron beta decay is theoretically speaking, at least the cleanest baryonic system where we can look, right? And so, and I can write my full equation, right? Where a VUD is the number I'm interested in. This is just a bunch of constants. And then there's a number of things that I need to measure experimentally, right? So experimentally, you need to know the Q value. That's simple enough, right? Mass difference between proton and neutron that gives you the Q value that we know well enough. Branching ratio is also trivial, right? It's just 100%, the neutron just, just beta decay. However, then we need to know two more things. One is the neutron lifetime, which sounds simple enough. And then we need to know these ratio of these two coupling constants, right? We have an axial coupling constant GA and we have a vector coupling constant GV and we only basically need to know the ratio because GV is equal to one. And this becomes quite tricky, right? Particularly for these two, specifically for the people in the field will know. And the reason why, right, is let's say, let's first look at this, uh, the first one, lambda, it's GA over GV, right? So the coupling constants. And so here is a graph, which just shows a sort of chronological history of experimental measurements of trying to get this number, right? And so you've seen an intro to particle or something that's roughly minus 1.25, right? It's a little more complicated than that. And it seemed that throughout the time we sort of converged to a value, right? But then another measurement came along, which is now over here, right? It has a different color because it was measured with a different observable, but which is suddenly, let's say two and a half to three sigma away. Right? It's like, we thought we got there. And then suddenly in 2019, these are both from 2019, uh, suddenly disagree again by, by two to three sigma or so. The neutron lifetime is of course a much more famous example, right? Where we can't figure out what the neutron lifetime is to better than a percent or so. Even though looking at the grand scale, you sort of see the similar kind of convergence, right? This is now a year of publication along the X axis and we seem to converge to some value. However, if you zoom in here, there's two different ways of measuring the neutron lifetime, right? So either you put a bunch of neutrons in a box, you wait for X amount of seconds and you see how many are left or you look at what are my decay products, right? So instead of counting neutrons, I'm now counting protons and electrons. And the problem is, is that these two famously give different answers, right? And this is again, one of these, I think by now it's probably also a four type sigma kind of, a, kind of issue that we've had since 2005 already. And so these are just very hard measurements, right? If this were easy, then we would have solved it already. And so we're trying to clearly get to the bottom of this. Even so, this is now a plot with sort of the, the status of the field where we have VUD, right? One number that we care about, and GA, the axial vector coupling constant on the other one. And so lifetime measurements give me diagonal bands, 
super allowed, right? The zero plus the zero plus decay just give me PUD. So that's just a, a horizontal band. You see that we're away from unitarity, which is over here. Um, but even so, if you take the vertical band here for GA, GA data and you take all of the lifetime data, we're actually not so far away from the super allowed. Right? And to, to quote someone who's been longer in the field than I have, this was pretty much unthinkable 15 years ago, right? That we could push the neutron that much to get the similar kinds of precision. Now, I want to take a bit of a tangent because I ask myself the question, what actually is GA, right? What are we actually measuring? Because this is interesting, right? We can now try to calculate this axial vector coupling constant on the lattice, right? We can try to do lattice QCD and try to calculate this value from first principles. Obviously, if we have an experimental value, we have a theory value, we can compare, right? And if they differ, that might be assigned for new physics. So can we do this, right? So if I have an experimental GA, can I say that it's equal to lattice QCD plus some potential new physics in this epsilon over here? Well, in order for us to get there and then for this to be meaningful, Lattice QCD still has quite a bit of work to do. However, they've made incredible progress. Right? We're now experimentally, we know this number to about 10 to the minus three. However, at the Lattice QCD side, we've come from, let's say tens of percents to now the most precise determination being below a percent, 0.7%. And so even with this situation, this channel is the most precise one to try and look for so-called right-handed currents, which is why the sub R is over here in the weak interaction. And so clearly this is an interesting channel to look at, right? Because colliders, colliders give you, for instance, this big circle over here, whereas the current GA versus lattice is the orange band. And so clearly there's a couple different points where we're pushing, right? We need to resolve what the lifetime is, we need to resolve what this axial vector coupling constant is. And so I'll be a bit biased, right? Because um, I'll talk about one experiment a bit later, but so I was involved in two of them. One was so-called UCN tau, which was at Los Alamos, which recently gave the most precise determination of the lifetime at the 0.04%. And then NAB is an experiment, which is now commissioning at Oak Ridge, which I'll talk about um, in a bit. We're just trying to measure GA. Okay. Now back to the question of what is GA actually? What happens when you have uh, a quantum field theory or whenever you have perturbation theory, let's say, right? My coupling constants get corrected due to higher order effects, right? And so I'm sort of shifting my values of my coupling constants away from the values that I would normally get. And so people, people typically write this as G squared goes to some G squared times one plus a small number. Right? And the small number is capital delta. However, when we're doing this experimentally, we've pulled out this renormalization and assumed that it's the same for vector and axial vector, right? We've just pulled out a one plus radiative corrections over there, which means that my actual GA is not just what we get from QCD, what we get from the strong interactions. It's also not just potential BSM physics, but it's also however much this changes from the axial to the vector side. And so this was never relevant because lattice QCD just wasn't there until let's say five years ago. And so if we don't have this number under control, then we might attribute some difference between experimental and lattice QCD values to new physics and try to go to Stockholm instead of checking our calculations, right? Okay, so that gets to the first, that was the introduction, let's get to the theory part. And so what are radiative corrections, right? And I'll keep this very short. But so radiative corrections in beta decay can pretty much be separated, and that's one nice thing, into something which doesn't depend on the energy of the electron, right? Because we're measuring spectra, but, or which does depend on the spectrum, but does not contain any strong interaction physics, right? Because the strong interaction physics is the hard part. However, we also have this rescaling of my coupling constants, which contains all of the strong interaction physics and doesn't change any of my kinematics, which is quite nice, right? And so the first one is mainly just real photon emission, right? Whenever I'm, let's say, if we think about this classically, if I'm accelerating a charge, right, I'm creating an electron coming out of beta decay. If you were to think about this classically, you're suddenly creating an accelerated charge, it's always going to radiate, 
right? There's always going to be a photon coming out. Whereas these capital deltas are pretty much all of this nasty loop effects, right? which are hard to calculate. Let's see. And so most of these are pretty well understood. And so there's a couple different graphs that you have to calculate, which we won't go into, but people have toiled on this for decades, right? And so this is pretty well understood. However, there is one sort of final remaining bastion, which was the so-called gamma W box. And you don't really need to remember this, but it just it looks like a box and there's a W boson here and there's a photon on the other, right? So it's a so-called loop and it, uh, we just call it a box. Now, the problem is, is that this is complicated because you can't rely on symmetries to calculate it, which means that you have to do a lot of hard work to actually get all of the strong interaction physics that's in this blob over there. Right? And that's basically what people have been working on for the past 50 years, right? Just getting all of the strong interaction physics, which is in that blob when a neutron goes to a proton in this loop. So what happened? Well, um, People in 2018 came up, with, came up with a new way of thinking about this using so-called dispersion relations, where we can now use, instead of trying to do all the hard calculations, we can try to use data from, for instance, um, accelerators or from electron scattering facilities like JLab, and actually just plug in the data through dispersion relations. All right, and so you can build this kind of diagram, but the main thing which happened is that we had sort of two giants of the field, Bill Marciano and Alberto Serlin had this value and they've refined it over years. In 2006, they had sort of their, their final best guess. Now in 2018, there were a couple of other people which, which tried to do this with dispersion relations. And suddenly we're again with this four sigma shift, right? Which for a field which boasts precision, this is a pretty heavy beating to take, right? If we suddenly go, like if we suddenly change one of our parameters by four sigma. And so to, to sort of graphically see what happened here is this is sort of our response of the nucleon in this, in this gamma W box diagram, right? And so we know the low energy stuff very well, right? Cause that's just nucleon, nucleon scattering. We know the high energy stuff very well because there were almost just like uh, striking quarks together, right? In which QCD becomes perturbative. But so everything in the middle is the hard part, right? That's when we're creating mesons and where we need to figure out what's actually happening. And so what they had done in 2006 is try to make some kind of interpolation. And so clearly if you picture it like this, it doesn't make much sense, right? But it didn't like, they never pictured it like this and that's obviously not their fault. Um, it's because the way that, that these dispersion relation people were able to plot this, that you could see that some of the approximations which they introduced to go from low to high energy eventually just didn't hold up. And so what happened is all of the shift comes from this middle range physics over here. Essentially all of the complicated stuff was boosted up in importance where this capital Delta is pretty much the area under, under this curve. And so this was, pretty much the beginning of our new CKM debacle, right? We started with, well, we have again, this two to three sigma non-unitarity. We didn't have it for about 20 years, I think from like mid nineties or so, and now we're back. Um, and now it's because of the nuclear people, I guess, and not the US people. Okay, um, now this is all about the vector stuff, right? So we also asked ourselves the question, well, what about the axial part? And this is work that I did, which also using dispersion relations, you can sort of alleviate yourself the work of doing hard calculations and instead use another dispersion relation to now use all of these data points, all of these black points here are data from colliders, from JLab, from Fermilab, and instead just directly put that into the integral rather than coming up with models for how this works. And so then you can do this both for the vector and for the axial vector. And so you can get all of this complicated physics, let's say for free, and right? at least that's the idea. Okay, and so we have these two values, right? So we have one for the vector, we have one for the axial vector. Um, this is just basically for Dan, I put this in, right? So then because, yeah, because <laughs> Dan works on mirrors and one of the side effects um, of doing this calculation was that we found a double counting issue, which made mirrors uh, in the global data set, mirrors were this sort of outlier here in the green band. And if you resolve the double counting, uh, 
then it suddenly jumps to the blue band and becomes more precise and consistent with everything else. Okay, but so the other thing you now is, well, we have these two numbers, so you can ask yourself the question, are we done? Let's see, how am I doing on time? Okay, so if we have the lattice and we have experiments, then of course we're sensitive to everything that's not included in the lattice, right? And so on the lattice, we can't do photons, right? We can't put a nucleon on the lattice and put a photon on there. And there's also some other isospin breaking effects, right? Where what I mean with that is the pion mass splitting. A neutral pion doesn't weigh as much as a charged pion. The up quark doesn't weigh the same amount as the down quark and so on. And so previous calculations assumed isospin symmetry. And so this is uh, a paper that we just worked on. It's, it's quite coincidentally nice. It just came online a couple of days ago um, where we discussed some of these improvements. And so let me just briefly walk you through an effective field theory and how we did this calculation, right? And so I started this talk with saying, yes, beta decay is great, right? We have this entire nuclear chart, but it's also hard because it's strong interaction physics, right? And so even though we know, let's say, what the strong interaction physics is, it's QCD, we can't actually solve it for nucleons, let's say, on a piece of paper. So what we do instead is we build an effective theory. And so an effective theory, for people who haven't done this before, is basically three things, right? One, you choose the relevant degrees of freedom, which particles you actually care about. Then you impose whatever symmetries the full theory has, and you write down all of the terms which are consistent with that theory. And then you typically define some small parameter that you can expand around, right? And that's the so-called separation of scales. Now, what this sort of uh, refers to is that you've all done a Taylor expansion, right? Now, effective field theory in sort of a very cutting corners way is you can do sort of a Taylor expansion in quantum field theory without necessarily knowing what the actual function is. You're just gonna measure the components of your different expansions, hopefully through experiments. Okay, and so this works, right? You can always do perturbation, or you can always do a Taylor expansion, but just like with the regular Taylor expansion, you know that this only works well if you choose the point around which you expand is actually a good point to expand around, right? And so this practical construction is almost more like an art form. Now people have figured this out and you can build this so-called EFT tower where the idea is that you can go from some high energy scale and go down to what the effect would be, let's say at the weak scale, what it would be at the nuclear scale. And you could sort of define this dictionary, right? Where you can reduce everything down to nuclear physics. And then if you have some favorite pet theory, you can just see what the effect is directly by just following the dictionary. I know obviously this is harder to do than it actually sounds like. And so we did a couple of calculations. I don't really have time to go into it. Um, but so we can define small scales, right? Where for instance, alpha, the fine structure constant is about 0.1%. Great, right? You can do perturbation theory around 0.1%. And we have a couple of others which are similar. Okay, and so what this ends up looking like in practice is you have to calculate a whole bunch of diagrams. Most of them turn out to be zero or cancel each other. Um, but what you find is a result which eventually turned out to be much larger than what we anticipated, right? So we care about these strong isospin breaking corrections to GA. And what we found is first the leading order, right? We find something which is 0.6% plus a constant, which we don't know. If we do this at one higher order, then we find another effect at 1.8%, right? Now remember, experimentally, we thought we knew this number to 0.1%. The lattice best determination was 0.7%. So if we now start introducing corrections, which are, let's say, 2% and more, then clearly, no, we've done a bit of a whoopsie, right? Because we've had such a big difference um, between what we thought we were comparing to what we're actually comparing. And so you need to shift all of your lattice values um, where some of these correspond to an almost a three sigma shift for the most precise one when you actually want to do a comparison with experimental ones. And so this was the first time that, that we've been doing this. Okay, this is not actually the halfway point. We're more at like 80% or so, right? So the takeaways are, we had this three sigma discrepancy in the sigma in the CQM unitarity matrix. I think I tried to make the argument that the neutron is a clear way forward and so we want to know more about this axial charge, this, uh, this coupling constants. We've done a couple of calculations for the first time. 
But basically, we're not ready yet to start comparing against a lattice QCD, right? We found much larger effects than we thought we were going to find, right? 2%. Okay. So let's quickly get into an experiment, right? Because I said that I was biased and I was going to talk about one of the experiments I was a part in. And one of these is the NAB experiment. NAB experiment is at Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge National Lab. And what we're doing there is obviously we're looking at neutron beta decay. Right? And so neutron beta decay, the decay rate looks like a bunch of stuff in there, plus something which depends on the outgoing angle between the electron and the antineutrino coming out. That's the so-called little a parameter, and that's what we care about. And so we have this massive apparatus. This is about seven and a half meters in total, and we'll go into slightly more detail in some slides. But when we measure this number little a, it has the quantity that we care about. Right, which was GA. In fact, if we measure this, we actually get a factor of five for free in precision on GA, which is extra nice, right? And which again is why the neutron is an interesting species. So what does this look like? This thing was absolutely massive and there was a lot of blood, sweat and tears to get this actually into Oak Ridge, right? This is the largest cryogen free system in the world, right? Which means that it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't use cryo cool or well, it doesn't use liquid uh, liquid nitrogen and helium to cool down uh, to, to low temperatures. But so this is about seven meters in diameter. It had to come in tilted. Um, I think a lot of people were close to a heart attack when, when they were trying to put it in, but eventually uh, it, got, it got put in in 2018. Now, how does this work? Well, we have some neutrons coming from the beam line coming through. And so they decay somewhere in flight. Now we want to measure the proton. Right, because we can't measure the energy, sorry, we can't measure the neutrino. Right, so, but you think, well, uh, conservation of momentum, conservation of energy, if we measure both the proton and the energy, the, both the proton and the electron, then we can just reconstruct what the angle was. Right, so we want to measure the proton. And how do we do that? We're basically doing it through time of flight. Because the neutron comes out with less than a kV of energy out of neutron beta decay. Right, so what we're doing is, it goes through a magnetic filter, right? Which basically just selects particles which have their momentum almost parallel with the time of flight region, right? Then the field goes down. We have about four or five meters of time of flight. And then we measure it in one of these two detectors, right? In an ideal kind of event, my electron from beta decay goes towards the left, provides me a start signal almost immediately, right? Because it's relativistic. Whereas my proton takes, let's say, 50 microseconds to get to the detector over there. Okay. And so you measured the proton, right? And so what this looks like, you can construct sort of a Dalitz type plot where we have the electron energy and proton momentum and everything that's allowed from phase space lies in this so-called teardrop shape. And if we make a cut at constant electron energy, then my proton spectrum looks like these trapezoids. And the slope of the trapezoid is proportional to little a value that we want to measure, right? So that's the, that's the procedure. We're measuring electron energies very well so we can make these cuts. And then we're looking at the proton momentum spectra through the time of flight and basically fitting to this linear part over here. Okay, now this all works well in, in, in theory, obviously, but so we need to get the proton from the time of flight. And it turns out that in order for us to meet our systematics budget, we cannot have a bias in the proton time of flight, which is larger than 300 picoseconds, which is a scary number, right? 300 picoseconds is, is, um, is, is quite at the edge of what we think uh, we can do, right? But so if we look at here, what the proton time of flight looks like, it's basically propagation through electric and magnetic fields. And then more interestingly, at least from my perspective, is what additional timing effects do you get due to detector effects? Right, and so there's, turns out that there's plenty of these, right? I'll just show this because there's no experimental talk without, uh, without an uncertainty budget slide, right? And so I'll, what I'm interested in for this talk is mainly detector effects and particularly how the time of flight can get shifted, right? So how do these detectors look like? They're highly segmented, extremely high purity, very large, 
and floating, right? So some of these are at high voltage, silicon detectors. And so all of these adjectives make this really nice and really interesting, but it also makes it very complicated, right? Every adjective you add makes it, makes it harder. And so we have 127 pixels. We need to isolate, electrically isolate pixels using either P-stop or P-spray for experts in the audience. And so we have about a hundred nanometer window or so. Now, what does it take, right, to get to this 0.3 nanoseconds? We're pretty much in requiring extreme things for timing, right? Because we have relatively low energy electrons, right? These are less than an MeV. We have only 30 keV protons because we're accelerating them right before they get to the detector. So they actually make it past the dead layer. But experimentally, this is pretty much sort of unknown territory. Right? And so we also have low signal to noise for protons. And so there's a whole shazam of things which couple in. Right? And so what we've done is we have a full pipeline, not just of Xi'an 4, but also an actual semiconductor model. We have electronic simulation and try to get to actual pulse shape, uh, uh, pulse shape prediction. And so we had several data campaigns already. Um, and so we're sort of leading the analysis and modeling effort here. And so this is just to give you an idea, we can get relatively good agreements uh, sort of percent level agreement with, with initial calibration spectra. We clearly see our proton peak over here in blue as a calibration source, 109 cadmium, which has an X-ray and two conversion lines. And we clearly see our proton peak here, just like above, nicely separated from the noise. We can get a good calibration. And so there is no major, uh, no major wrenches in the machine at this level. So what have we done then? Well, we've, we've constructed this modeling effort and there's a whole bunch of stuff. Which, which comes in and all of which is very interesting to talk about, but which I don't have time to. So I'll just try to show you a couple examples of what I think are cool things, all right? So one is, for instance, plasma effects. So when you have, a, uh, when you have an interaction in the silicon, right? You're basically creating a bunch of charge and normally your charges start drifting and you start getting a signal in your detector, right? You start inducing uh, charge on some FET. However, if you have a sufficient amount of charge here together, then just because of the amount of charge, you almost make like a plasma and the plasma shields external electric fields, right? It basically starts shielding your drift field, which gives you your signal. And we care all about timing, right? So if there's a delay in here, that basically means we're screwed, right? So unless we know this very well. And so we've now done the first time for like this microscopic scale um, because our proton tracks are only 300 nanometers into the silicon detector. And so we can, try to actually do this, uh, this charge cloud simulation and we find effects which are on the order of 0.1 nanoseconds or so, which is again, right at the very edge, right? Here you can see a histogram versus at different times for electrons and holes. And so what you should be seeing is that here in the middle one, right? Basically my charges are sticking together because there's just an external shielding of the electric field. They're not moving, right? Because they don't see a net electric field because all of the charge around it. And so it takes them a lot longer to start separating. We've done COMSOL simulations. We've done a whole bunch of things. Um, and I think I need to start wrapping up so you can ask me questions about it, right? But so we can do these microscopic type simulations. We even got Micron to tell us what the dead layer looks like, which I was honestly really surprised about. They're usually kind of cagey about, about giving detector specifications. So we had uh, SIMS data, secondary ion mass spectroscopy, I think, right? So you're basically just ablating the surface and then doing a mass separation to see um, what ions are on your surface and how much of them there are. And so I thought this was very cool, right? So our boron is effectively, that's your P-type window, right? And so we had data where we got data both before and after annealing, right? So before annealing, it's obviously a little sharper. After annealing, things start diffusing a little bit. But so we can use this data now and actually construct an actual charge collection efficiency model, right? So typically when you've worked with the silicon detector, you've heard of dead layer, right? And so dead layer is typically the entrance window where you assume that any energy that gets deposited in the dead layer just doesn't get collected. You don't see it. In reality, it's a little more complicated, right? Because there's almost never just 0% charge collection. Some of your charge will always make it out even just by diffusion. However, we can now use the SIMS data and try to actually get a physics model for what charge collection efficiency would look like 
And based on what we found and together with some other people have, have reconstructed from experimental measurements, we find that it's sort of a much more gradual kind of going from 0% to full charge collection over a length scale uh, of let's say 100 to 200 nanometers rather than just nothing, everything, right? And so if, if a particle only travels 150 nanometers or so, that's a pretty big difference for us, right? We've done spice simulations for the electronics part, right? It's not, uh, it's, uh, people who've done this before will see the usual elements and for the others, it's not very useful to go through this right now. Right? It's just, we've done the exercise, we've gone through it and eventually we can make these pulse shapes, which depend on where we hit on the pixel, right? Due to geometrical effects, we can reconstruct timing biases. We think we have, if we weren't to use our model, um, and so the bottom line there is, if we were to do that, if we didn't go through this whole exercise, we would basically have a two nanosecond bias on our experiment, which is an order of magnitude larger than what we wanted, right? Which was 0.3 nanoseconds. And so this will now be sort of the standard procedure going through, uh, which of course places a computational load on, on the whole analysis as well. But I thought it was very cool that we could end up doing this. So this is just to show we get percent level agreement, right? If we compare this for, for average waveforms with protons. Um, and so there's, uh, we even reconstructed some, some feedback in the, uh, in the electronic circuit just because the waveforms lined up so nicely. And so we can now go back and do bench testing and see where the uh, where ground loops were, where parasitic capacitances were. Um, but so this is almost my last slide, right? So experimentally, we put in the second detector. Um, in May of this year, we've seen neutron beta decay electrons. We had beam time. Uh, we're gonna have several more beam times over winter and next summer before the long shutdown. And so hopefully we'll have sort of a statistics only result um, in a couple of years. We're in like, let's say a year or two for little a. And so with that, I just wanna end. Um, I think I tried to convince you that uh, CKM unitarity and these BSM searches have really gained a lot of uh, uh, interesting developments of the past couple of years. And I tried to convince you that the neutron is sort of a clear path forward there with the axial charge, right? So GA being on the critical path, right? And so there's both theory and experimental progress. And it's, I think it's been very interesting to see how over the past four years or so, there's been a lot of new people coming in, coming up with new ideas and really sort of changing uh, what's going on. And so I believe the neutron is going full steam, uh, full steam ahead and then we'll see where we end up, right? So the standard model or beyond. And with that, thank you for your audience. Thanks to collaborators and uh, obviously funding agents. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. not off there. You were so worried about timing, but you didn't say anything about the beam. So in our experiment, where we measure momentum from timing mm -hmm. limited by the size of our source. Oh, really? So is that negligible for you? Um, for you us, that's right. So we have a cold neutron beam going through. Um, but so essentially, the only thing that we care about is, is our time difference between the electron hit and the proton hit. But we can do more than that. Um, because we have individual pixels, we can also do topological reconstruction. So they have to basically hit the same pixel. Um, and then we also have to do some beam studies, obviously, on what the beam size is or what the beam spot is. Um, is that, small enough? that is small enough, yes. Yeah, but also, I mean, well, so the nice thing is because we have a segmented detector, we can essentially see what our beam profile looks like at least projected on both on both axes. And we'll do some systematic measurements for along the beam line to see what the beam actually looks like. Mm -hmm. um, but so because we have this segmented detector, we can also use the outer pixels, which normally don't see the beam, also as background, uh, background measurements and sort of uh, and basically plug that into whatever coincidental or coincident, accidental coincidences we might have and what that might look like. So you have this pro-simulation. It's very nice that you like using the 0.3 nanosecond camera system, but how do you calculate this system? It's like any 
Right. So that's an excellent question, right? So obviously there's a couple of free parameters in the model, right? Which you have to uh, either constrain from theory or other experiments or do particular measurement campaigns. One of them, which is particularly relevant for us is whether the purity of the crystal is actually homogeneous in the radial direction. Right, so normally if you have a silicon detector, right, so you have always some residual impurities, and if they're small enough, you can basically assume that it's homogeneous over your entire silicon detector. However, ours are well, obviously not this large, right? They're, they're about 12 centimeters in diameter, which for a silicon detector is huge, right? These are typically max one centimeter squared or so. And so do you, because these silicon detectors are so large, just from the fabrication, you can have substantial variation in what the homogeneity is of your doping, which in turn changes the electric fields at particular locations. And so, which also determines timing, right? So one of the things that we are now able to do instead is because this is a parameter in our model, we can see how it changes observables and then propose a measurement campaign to try and get this out, right? So we can basically look at, if we take a narrow proton beam and bring it to the edge of the pixel or go across pixels or go across the detector, see how rise times change. And based on other information of the model, we're able to pull out, for instance, what radial uh, inhomogeneities are. So that's one of the main, main things. And so we'll have to, like we have a proposal for a measurement campaign to do that. We have an apparatus to do it with. And so obviously fingers crossed that, that the data that we get out, we're able to interpret in a clean way. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So let me let me uh, uh, sort of comment on the first part. Right. So you're you're completely right. Right. So I think I went by uh, a little quickly, and I basically want to show that we had a big change. Indeed, Marciano went back, I think, in 2019. Right. So like a year after this was published came up with a different kind of approach and found something which agreed at the 1.5-ish sigma level or something. Um, I came in at 2020, I believe, and so my initial goal was to calculate this for the axial one, and as a byproduct, I got the one for vectors for free. My value um, lied or uh, was pretty much on top of the uh, Sengadal, despite using an approach which is very similar to um, to to what to what Bill did, to what Bill Martiano, et cetera, did, and part of the discussion in the paper is actually because I argue that they forgot about a particular contribution when doing their uh, Bill's quote poor man dispersion poor man's dispersion relation approach, and these are these so-called target mass corrections, which is when you go down to when Q squared is about equal to M squared, the nucleon squared mass, um, you can't just take scattering data and uncorrect it, there's effectively kinematic corrections because now like the, 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 uh, the mass, sorry, the, the energy difference is about the same as the mass difference. So you will just get kinematic shifts. And so that they didn't take into account. And that actually, uh, I, I tried to reason, um, actually gave the 1.5 sigma difference or so between what Marciano ended up doing in 2019 and what, and what Seng et al. did in 2018. So that resolved most of that difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right, so... Um, one of the tricky things, obviously, is that there is many more bottle experiments now than there are beam experiments, right? And so there's been several bottle experiments, and even though that there's some internal inconsistencies, which we could also talk about, they all fall about 
let's say eight or nine seconds below the beam lifetime. Whereas for the beam lifetime, the only experiment that we really have with this two second uncertainty uh, is, is from a BL2 analysis. And so they haven't published a final analysis yet. However, I know that BL3 has now, like the magnet's been funded. Um, the detectors that they're using are the same ones that they're now using in NAB. And so as far as I know, this is, this is very much moving forward at NIST. Um, there's a couple approaches which are still um, sort of, I guess, experimental, where ideally what you would want to measure is you have an experiment which measures both beam and bottle at the same time, right? Like you put a bunch of neutrons in a bottle and you're also, um, you're also detecting protons, right? And so then after X amount of time, you empty the bottle and see how many neutrons you have left, right? That way, you have both beam and bottle measurements. And so the UCN probe um, is, is an approach there, but that's, I think it has sort of funding to do R&D essentially, but I think that's still a ways away. So, I mean, I'm kind of hard pressed to answer that because ideally we would want more beam lifetime experiments and ideally you would want different people doing the experiments, right? So now BL3 is going to be mostly the same people as, as the ones that did BL2. Um, I don't know, throw more money at the field, I guess. Um, but it's kind of curious, right? That we can measure, for instance, as I'm sure you've done like lifetime. Oh, okay. Ah, uh, okay. So um, for GV is actually, let's see, can I flip through a bunch of slides? So GV was actually the first calculation that, that tried to use dispersion relations. Sorry, just close your eyes for five seconds. It's further back than I thought. Almost there. Okay. So for GV, this is actually the, the, the first impetus to do this, right? Because GV goes into the super loud VUD extraction as well. And so there is much more motivation to get, to get for the vector ones. And so that's what these people in, in 2018 did, which is um, essentially construct uh, not just a one-dimensional, but a two-dimensional, um, how would I put it? I guess interaction graph or something where you can sort of almost delineate which type of physics is relevant depending on the energy transfer and the momentum transfer. And so the Born peak is trivial, right? That's just first Born approximation. If you go very high in Q squared, then you're effectively just looking at, at perturbative QCD. You're just mushing quarks together and that we can do perturbatively. And so all of the hard parts are in here. And I think this is where, where they really came up with novel things to use um, uh, both Reggie models, right? So vector meson dominated models and also take, uh, uh, take neutrino nucleon scattering or neutrino nucleus scattering from, I believe it was JLab um, and put that in part um, of the, uh, the, the resonance and background and also in part of the NPI um, process. In fact, it's, it's kind of, uh, well, it's interesting that it's much harder to do this dispersion relation for the vector one than it was for the axial vector one, because you don't get a one-to-one -one translation if you start doing isospin rotations. And so I can't look at your face right now, so I can't see if that made sense or not. Um, but uh, for the axial one, you actually get a one-to-one -one translation if you do an isospin rotation and you just go from effectively beta decay to polarized Bjork and some role, right? So effectively polarized electron scattering off of nuclei. So you could, you could much cleaner, cleanlier do it in GA than you could in GV, even though that one came after. Thank you, guys, again. If you want to speak to me, I'll have a fair bit of free time tomorrow.